So I would like to introduce our speaker first. Anshu Dubey. Um, Anshu Dubey is a, uh, currently a member of the Mathematics and Computer Science Department here at Argonne. As she, she's joined as a computer scientist. She spent uh, 12 years at the University of Chicago in the Astronomy and Astrophysics Department as first uh, a lead application developer, then the computer science applications group leader, and the associate director of the FLASH project. And this project was responsible for developing a very large community code called FLASH. Um, in addition, she's done substantial work on software architecture and patterns within scientific codes and uh, an adaptive mesh refinement. Um, so she'll be speaking to us today about some really key best practices for what scientific software should do. For those uh, who are listening, we will have an opportunity for questions, multiple opportunities. So first, if you do have questions, please enter them in the, the text, the chat section. And what I will do is we will collect those. There's about five different sections to Anshu's talk. And so when we reach one of the end of those sections, if there are questions, um, we, will, we will feed those through to Anshu. So one of us will read them off to her. But I'll, I'll encourage you to type the questions as you have them. And, and that way, when we get to the end of the session, we will have questions ready to go since, you know, no one, a few people type anyway, as fast as they can speak. Um, but please do type in the questions and uh, otherwise we won't, the, the number of people on the call will be really hard to manage with audio. All right. Thank you very much, Anshu. Thank you for that introduction, Catherine. Um, so this is a series of webinars that we have conceived in order to bring best practices to the uh, HPC um, practitioners. Uh, this is a collaboration among the IDI Scientific Software Productivity Project, which is basically focused in improving software productivity of the scientific uh, codes, Argonne Leadership Computing Facility, National Energy Research Scientific Computing Center, Oak and Oak Ridge Leadership Computing Facilities. Um, what I will do is, in the first section of my talk, I will give you an overview of the series, which is the objectives, what we hope to achieve by uh, through this series and the next few seminars, uh, webinars that you can expect to see in this series. And then I will move on to the technical section of this talk, which will have four other sections, but I'll get to that later. Uh, so the objective of this series is to bring the knowledge of useful software engineering practices to HPC scientific code developers. Notice the emphasis on useful what we do not wish to do is prescribe any set of practices as a must use for any codes. Uh, instead, what we really want to do is to collect the experiences and knowledge that is acquired by various teams that have been working in this realm and be as informative as possible about these practices that have worked for some of the projects. So um, our emphasis is on letting you know the practices that are there and to that so that you can pick and choose the practices that will help your productivity rather than put unsustainable burden on your team we also will highlight the various customizations that other teams have done and um, to um, indicate how the customizations can be done as needed that is and you can do that for yourself based upon the information that we make available we will do it as much as possible through examples and case studies and we will give references for available resources and suggestions for further reading um, the webinars in the series today's webinar is basically an overview and introduction um, what we plan want to do in this webinar is to provide a uh, the motivation as to why should a computational scientist worry about software process, the uh, practices that many codes have adopted and found useful, examples of customizations, and one of the topics that will not be co covered by other webinars but we think is extremely important is discussion of community codes, uh, why they are helpful, and how can one go about building a community. Uh, the next webinar in the series will be two weeks from today at the same time. 
and that will be given by Barry Smith on developing, configuring, building, and deploying HPC software, um, the tools and best practices for configuration and building of your software, some basic principles of software design and development, um, helpful hints that will that can help developer productivity through use of development environments and customizations for project needs. Following that, two weeks later, there will be a talk on distributed version control and continuous integration text, uh, testing. This will be done by Jeff Johnson, who will use Git as the example platform. And he will talk about using it for not just version control, but also as a development platform and a control change process, uh, which he will explain through the uh, use of pull requests and mechanisms for communicating and tracking progress. He will also talk about continuous integration with Travis CI. Uh, the fourth webinar in the series will be on testing and documentation of put. This will be given by Alicia Klimbex. Um, because testing and documentation both are in particular practices that can you can do too much or too little, both of which is too bad. So we will hope to give uh, we hope to give guidelines on how to evaluate your own team needs and the extent of testing that is useful for your team rather than burdensome. Uh, we will also talk about granularity of testing, whether you do unit tests, uh, integration level tests, system level tests, etc. The definitions and how to leverage this testing granularity, not only to pinpoint failure, but also to provide code coverage. And in addition, it's also important to talk about how to get buy-in from the development team, and that will be covered in this talk as well. Uh, following that, we uh, the details for the next three talks will follow later. One of them will be uh, uh, the HPC environment and how it differs from desktop and why. Basic performance, analysis and optimization, and best practices for I.O. on HPC systems. Um, with that, this is the um, end of the section on overview. Catherine, do we have any questions so far? Um, there is one question, and, and I can address it immediately, which is that all slides um, and the video with audio will be available after the event. Um, you will get an update on where you can find that link. Thank you. So. The technical section of my this particular webinar is uh, divided into four sections. The first section is about the motivation. The second se section talks about uh, um, basically surveys from various communities and the customizations they have done, the practices they've adopted. Um, the third section will be on best practices. And finally, I will talk about community development. The motivation section, so most uh, of the, the most people that start out in computational start with what is called heroic programming and heroic programming is in principle um, doing whatever it takes to make a project work. Um, the text here has been picked straight from this uh, link that you can see and this this particular link defines um, heroic programming as expenditure of huge amounts of coding effort by talented people to overcome shortcomings in process project management scheduling architecture or any other shortfalls in the execution of software development project in order to complete it scientific teams often resemble heroic programming and what is more troublesome is many do not see anything wrong with that approach. And I can quote one anecdote uh, from uh, my own experience about a particular team that wanted to do simulations on material which turn into um, solids through sheer stress. And so they talked to us at the Flash Center about how to go about whether they can use flash and how to go about doing it we realized that what they needed to do would require quite a bit of uh, effort so we um, gave to them information about what we would need to how much we would need to work with them and how would we go about doing this at the end of that discussion i was told oh we will just get a couple of postdocs and we will do it because this is how we do our science we do whatever it takes to the best of my knowledge, that project has not gone anywhere. Um, to emphasize on what is wrong with heroic programming, um, see, in the there are projects, there are some results that can that you can do with one or two people just writing a simple small um, amount of code, 
and getting their results from them. But by and large, and this was very fruitful way to do things in the beginning when computational science was just beginning to get started as a valid way of doing science. Uh, but the scientific results that could be obtained with heroic programming have pretty much run their course. And that is because uh, as you have better scientific understanding, you want to refine your models. When you refine your models, your software becomes more complex because you have more equations added into it. You have more models added into it. Your numerical methods gets more get more sophisticated, so you have more complex software. When you have more software, com complex software, then you really need to start focusing on different aspects of it at different times. For example, the mathematical model, the numerical algorithms that implement those mathematical models, the verification of your numerics and verification is not just correctness, it is also stability and convergence and the performance of your code. What these need is to have people with different roles and responsibilities in the team. And it is not a possible any longer for a single person to take on all of these roles. So it becomes important to have to move away from the model of heroic programming and start to have a team. Um, this becomes a, an even bigger problem in extreme scale science, which is what the leadership class uh, facilities and the other high performance supercomputing facilities uh, deal with. It is because they are typically places where codes that are aiming for higher fidelity modeling are operating. They have multi-physics codes, therefore their codes are more complex. They are, their simulations are more complex, even their analysis is more complex. They're, they have many, many models in the same code because of which there are many moving parts that need to interoperate with one another. They need a variety of expertise, not just in domain science because they have multi-physics within the code, but also uh, they need certain amount of method expertise, they need numerical expertise, they need software engineering expertise, because that's the uh, only way to make these codes work. And the only tractable model is through separation of concerns where different people can focus on what they know best. And for it is much more difficult to work on the same software in different roles unless you have a software engineering process in place. Uh, if anything, this has become worse with the onset of ha higher platform heterogeneity because now you not only need experts who know science and software, they, you also need experts that can understand the different demands placed upon the performance of a code by different aspects of a, a platform architecture. So the only, and these requirements are not very well known so far, they're still only unfolding. So no one has clear answer as to how to design and implement a code so that it can tackle platform heterogeneity. So the only safeguard that we have pretty much is to invest in flexible design and robust software engineering practices so that changes and adjustments to platforms is not as onerous um, as it is if you're starting from scratch. <clears throat> Um, and there are other reasons in other realms in addition to the extreme scale computing, and that is um, accretion leads to unmanageable software. When I say accretion, what I'm talking about is um, someone started a software assuming that it is only going to have a short lifespan, that it is going to um, uh, give a very specific answers, but then someone else found that code useful and started adding to it. And soon enough, this code gets a life of its own and people keep adding to it. And before you know, the code has become this large collection of uh, capabilities that have become essentially unmanageable. What it does is it, it increases the cost of management. Parts of software may even become unusable over time, but that is the smaller of uh, the challenges posed by accreted software. The bigger problem is that as you start to collect more and more components, more and more capabilities in your software, um, if there is no verification, if there isn't adequately defined verification process, soon you will stop having confidence in your own results. And this has been known to happen in the past. There have been retractions of papers because the software that was used for producing results was not verified enough and the wrong results were produced. In addition to that, this increases the ramp on time for new developers when people come in and there is a structured software. In complex software, it takes long enough time for new developers to become truly productive in the code anyway. When the software um, is also without any structure, if they can't get a handle on 
where various things in the software are. It just takes much longer for the, soft, for the new developers to um, become productive members of the team. And this, what it does is it reduces um, software and science productivity both due to technical debt. Technical debt is a term that is, de um, that is used to describe the uh, debt that is incurred in quick and dirty practices that then collects interest in terms of more effort needed to add feature to the software. So you pay your technical debt by indul indul indulging in better design. If you have better design, then um, you are pretty much able to add features without too much effort. But and as the um, design becomes more and uh, design becomes less and less effective, the technical debt incurred by adding features also grows. So it's very important to keep that in mind. Uh, when design, when um, making decisions about the software, the changes to the software and its design. And I finished this section with the with this quote. It seems likely that significant software contributions to existing scientific software projects are not likely to be rewarded through the traditional reputation economy of science. Together, these factors provide a reason to expect the overproduction of independent scientific software packages and the underproduction of collaborative projects in which later academics build on the work of earlier ones. And all of all those of us who have been in this business long enough are very familiar with this process. Um, the last section of my talk on community codes will in particular address um, this uh, issue about how uh, the reusability of components and not too many little efforts that are independent is useful to the community. Um, questions on this section? The, no questions so far. I'll give a quick second, just a couple seconds to see if anything shows up. Okay, go ahead. We move on to the section on customization. So in customization, first I'll give you um, summaries from two different uh, um, sources. The first one is a, a survey conducted by the IDEAS Software Productivity Project. In the beginning of the project, it started um, in 2014. And first thing that the members of this project did was to conduct a survey on the practices, software practices that were prevalent among the participating teams and where they saw their pain points and where they thought this product, this project could be the most helpful. So participating in this survey were five application codes and four numerical libraries. Uh, what we found out from this survey were the following. All of the projects, every one of the projects uses version control and all but one of them also use distributed version control. Um, the next talk will, the actually two talks from today, you will get much more details about the difference between distributed and version controls. But SVN is SVN and CVS are examples of non-distributed version control. Git, Mercurial, etc., are examples of distributed version controls. Um, the builds in these projects are equally divided between GNUMake and CMake. All of the projects provide some form of documentation with some some form of user's guide to their users. Most of them use automated documentation generation tools in order to produce their documentation. The amount of documentation provide, provided varies from code to code. All the codes have testing in some form. The dominated form is integration testing where various components are joined together to uh, do regression, to uh, verify the overall correctness of the code. A couple of them do, um, manual regression testing, but quite a few of them are also automated. Uh, roughly half the projects make use of unit testing explicitly, and majority of these codes are publicly available. There are a few that are not, but majority of them are publicly available. The second source that I'm summarizing from is uh, from a workshop on community codes that was conducted in 2012 at the University of Chicago under uh, NSF funding. This one, uh, so the 
the previous survey was mostly from codes that are um, in the earth sciences community. This one, the, the community code workshop, had codes from a wide variety of domains. So the codes that participated in this workshop was, was FLASH, which is astrophysics, CACTUS, which is numerical general rel relativity, ENZO for cosmology, ESMF for earth system, Lattice QCD code suite, AMBER, which is quantum chemistry, CHAMBO is an AMR, package and YT, which is an analysis and visualization tool that is mostly used by the astrophysics community and more now. Uh, the few common themes that ran through the codes that gave presentations in this workshop was that the software architecture was almost always in the form of composable components. And this is because the, the developers of these codes realize that th these are research codes, which means that information keeps coming in more and more the, as, as the scientific understanding go, uh, grew, they would need to um, modify their codes. So they understood the need for extensibility and that is why composable components were part of their code. All these codes without exception have rigorous auditing plus process in place, which means that they have process not only for testing, but also gatekeeping for contributions, policies for contributions from internal and external users, though models vary from code to code. Um, all these codes also have wide user communities and all codes assert that communities benefit greatly from having a common, highly exercised code base. Um, there is a question. question. Yeah. Uh, so the question is, am I hearing that it is impossible for a lone scientist to be productive on a leadership class machine and a team is required? Um, I would say that um, it is not impossible, but I would need a great deal of convincing to believe that that would be possible because a lone scientist so I can see a lone scientist becoming productive if the lone scientist had a community code that they could customize. But I don't see a large scale scientific problem that you start from scratch, you're able to build all the models that you might need in that scientific problem that it would actually need leadership science uh, class capable code in order to be productive. Now, there can be domains I'm, that are exceptions to this, but by and large, I think it is true that you will need uh, either a community code or a community in order to be productive at leadership class facilities. Now, um, the challenge is that both the sources for our community codes found was that that the, the, the challenges are broadly uh, classifiable into two sections, the technical and the sociological. The technical sections are that all parts of the cycle can be under research, which means that your models are under research, your understanding of the physics is under research, the numerical methods that are used to implement the models are under research. So, and the requirements from all of these aspects of uh, code development change throughout the life cycle as knowledge grows. Um, in addition, for all of them, verification is complicated not only by the complexity of the code itself, but also because they're all dealing with floating point representation. So relying upon bitwise um, matching of answers, even though is desirable, is not always available to them. So they have to understand their error bars much more clearly. The real world is messy. And so the software that deals with has to deal with, has to, um, figure out how to not be messy when the natural tendency of such software would be too messy. And then there are the sociological challenges such as competing priorities and incentives because the science is always interested in getting a quick answer to whatever is being developed. They pose a question, they want a quick answer. But in order to enable the capability that may give that quick answer, a code may need to take longer than the scientists would like. So there are all these competing priorities in play. Usually teams operating in this um, area are working with re fewer resources than they ideally need. And so whenever they see, uh, they perceive an overhead that is coming their way without a tangible benefit, they are resistant to uh, adopting practices. And in addition to all of that, when one is dealing with multi-physics, multi-model codes, um, 
that also require some computer science and software engineering expertise, the um, need to pay attention to interdisciplinary inter interactions becomes critical. Um, the customizations, uh, a guide, general guideline for customizations in these codes has been that when they started developing, many of them predate any knowledge of software engineering in the scientific science, computing community. So many of them evolve their own testing methodologies and they follow this methods as understood by, um, they do not follow the methods as understood by the software engineering research community. They developed according to their own needs. And um, so in some sense, the extent and granularity of their testing reflects the project priorities and the team size. So if you look at a small team, it, ha it is much more informal and the, their testing reflects that. And there are larger teams that have much more formalization. The life cycle of a scientific code is much closer to what I'm going to show in the figure in the next slide. Uh, most of this, these teams have not adopted any formal development model as outlined by the software engineering community. The development model, they all have some kind of development model. Most of them are ad hoc and again, devised based upon the, their own understanding and their own specific needs. The closest that any of the software engineering development models come to what is adopted, what is used in the scientific software community is the agile model because, because there is this need to quickly have the development available for users to use for their science. But of the projects that we have talked about so far, none of them follow it explicitly. Um, they much more, they, all of these are much more adapted from the models that are available in the wider community and they, much, they are much more responsive to the needs of the life cycle. So this is what a software life cycle looks like. What it starts out with is scientists who want to model some phenomena in the physical world. And when I mean physical world, I don't mean just physics. It also includes biology and chemistry modeling, but it is just physical world. This particular life cycle is indicative of the modeling of physical world that is in that can be done with partial differential equations. So you start with formulating a model, which is in the form of equations. These equations are reflective also of the approximations made in doing the modeling. Sometimes you drop a term because it's not well understood. Sometimes you uh, take an easier equation to solve because the harder equation is just intractable um, given the resources, etc. So these are approximation end up in the equations. The equations are then discretized and give rise to difference equations. The difference equations themselves are then implemented in form of numerical solvers. Um, and the numerical solvers are verified for their correctness, accuracy, stability. And uh, then the implementation of the software is uh, confronted with either an experiment or observation from the physical world in order to validate the, that the modeling is correct. So that is the outer loop of the life cycle. Inside that there are a few inner loops because as I said, most of these are under research themselves. So when there is an improvement in a numerical method or a new numerical method comes along, there is this short circuit which can modify the equations that are used to model. Uh, similarly, an implementation may be, th this loop comes into play when an implementation um, is modified because of a certain criterion of accuracy and stability are managed and the validation itself can give, give rise to model fidelity which can in turn change the equation. So this is basically what a typical um, computational science life cycle looks like. Um, and in the end that feeds into what is the software productivity cycle which is which is also available from the IDEA's uh, productivity website, which is you raise the scientific questions, you do experimental design. This design can be um, a physical experiment or it can be a computational experiment. And uh, you can sometimes make use of the software development even for experimental design. So you model and do the software development, you do testing validation, you do simulations, analysis and validation, and the internal cycle reflects the software the execution, the workflow, and the analysis. And these in a cycle ultimately end up in scientific discovery. Um, again, this link is where more, uh, is the report from the software productivity, work, productivity workshop that gave rise to this 
view of scientific productivity. And that is the end of this section. Do we have questions? No questions, right? No questions, okay. Um, I think there's scope. To? Okay. I'll, I'll collect them as we go, so. Okay. Um, the next section is on some of the best practices as we have collected from the um, surveys and experiences of people who are participating in building this. Um, so the software process baseline is what um, all codes should do um, insofar as po it's possible within their resources. Again, I want to reemphasize that the um, idea behind the series of webinars is not to dictate to people what they should be doing. The idea behind this webinars is to make all the information that we have gathered, all of the acquired wisdom available to the community. So, so the community, the, the practitioners in the community can may pick and choose the knowledge as it applies to them and adopt it for their own purposes and even evolve and give us back the information. So, but one thing that people should do is invest in extensible code design because it is very rarely true that a code just serves one purpose and finishes there. Even if you start out by assuming that that's exactly what you're designing a code for, typically others will find use for it and it will grow. So giving some thought to code design right up front is a useful thing. It's not just useful for extensibility, but also if you, as you're divide, designing your code, if you give some thought to design, you will also side by side develop a verification process for that code so that even that small little piece of code, you will have greater confidence in the reliability of results. Uh, whether you're doing a single co single small code development or a large code, I strongly recommend, I personally strongly recommend using version control. My personal data is also managed under version control. Once I got familiar with it, there was no way I was going to live life without that convenience in life. Um, so earlier in this talk, I talked about technical debt. Version control and automated testing, you can think of almost as technical saving, uh, building up your resources. Because if you invest in doing this right up front, the amount of time it's going to save you down the line is going to be huge. Because every time you add a little bit to the code, if you have an automated testing built in there, it will test right there and you will catch a defect as soon as possible without having to backtrack a great deal. And in the Flash Center, we found this, that anybody who came and became a part of the Flash Center got used to the automated testing that we were doing. When they left the center, they built this um, ethos with them. It just went with them and they instituted it wherever they went. They just refused to work without it. Um, so, and any non-trivial code, any to code that uh, that is planning to have any sort of longer life should definitely institute a rigorous verification and validation regime right in the beginning. If there is a team defining coding and testing standards is absolutely important because everybody in a team has their own different coding style and their own different testing style. If, if um, you do not have, um, and also these codes are typically developed in environments like universities and uh, academic locations where the developing population is sort of transient. People come and go, graduate students graduate, postdocs move on to permanent jobs. And so if their code cannot be understood by someone once they have left, that part of the code cannot be maintained. So um, it is very important to have a uniformity in coding <clears throat> practices. So some, some minimal degree of coding standards and testing standards are necessary. It is also well, very important to have a well, have well-defined policies for auditing of the code and the maintenance of the code. Whether that auditing requires making sure that the coding and coding standards are met, what are the testing practices, uh, who is responsible for making sure that the code that tests are mostly passing, etc. Um, the distribution and contribution, because uh, 
distribution relates to whether the code is a closely held co code within internally uh, or whether it is going to be released, what is the extent of release, how much of the code is released to the wider public. And contribution is whether the code is going to be taking any contribution from outside contributors, and if so, what are the contribution, contributing possible policies. And I will touch a little bit on this towards the end of the talk. And they, there should also be clear and well-defined policies for documentation. Now, the next part is about the practices that are desirable but are much uh, harder to achieve and uh, have not sort of penetrated as much in the community. And one of the an important one is provenance and re reproducibility. So by now, the practice of computational science has achieved enough of uh, uh, what I would call validation as a scientific discovery tool that more and more the um, scrutiny is being subjected, um, scrutiny is being directed at results produced out of computations. And uh, so more and more community is becoming aware of the, the importance of reproducibility in order to match the degree of, uh, you know, um, reliability of results as it exists in other uh, forms of scientific discovery like experimentation and theory. Um, and provenance is an important aspect of it because provenance lets you go back and practice uh, and uh, reproduce the results. Um, this is reflected actually in even in this year's supercomputing uh, call for papers where people were, um, where the submitters were offered a chance to participate in a reproducibility drive where you could, they could designate if that, if, I mean, they, they could indicate if their paper was uh, uh, going to participate in this. And there is a question. So yes, there, um, I, I will read it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, a number of sociological challenges often set the tone for software development. For example, a lot of projects have only one or two FTEs for the software development and often split across multiple people who are split on multiple projects and that come from multiple organizations. Many of the traditional software engineering practices such as Agile work because developers are 100% on one project. Do you have suggestions on how to operate a successful software engineering team in such circumstances? Um, the answer is no. Um, I am actually personally facing this issue right now in that I am on three different projects, each one of which has their own Agile-like, not quite, but Agile-like development, and I'm having a hard time juggling it. So if someone in the community has an answer to this problem, I'd be very happy to um, hear about it. And actually, I think it can benefit the whole community. In fact, it can even make it to one of the things that I'm going to talk about later, which is the how-tos of uh, um, collected by the idea of software productivity, because yes, it, it is a very important question and we, at least I don't have the answer to it. And in fact, if anybody among the audience has uh, an answer and an experience to share where something has worked for them, I can leave time at the end of the, um, they, they can type in the chat and I will read it out for people at the end of the talk. There's also a question in the chat. Um, Hold on one second, there's one more question. Okay. Um, could you please elaborate a little more about coding standards? Any explicit examples? Um, coding standards, for example, um, so explicit examples, the easiest one to give uh, on the fly for me is from the flash code because that's the one I'm most familiar with. So in the flash code, um, it's basically in Fortran 90. So there is not a whole lot of uh, lang language-based checking of things that you could do. So what, what we did in coding standards was, we, what we said was every component would have its API and its API would be defined in an interface module of Fortran 90. And this is required of everybody because um, then what happens is if you, it, so the compilers are uh, ignore mismatch in arguments if you don't have a, uh, an interface block. But if you have an interface block, the compiler will catch it. So this was one coding standard. Other coding standards had to do with naming conventions so that 
if you followed the convention, you could immediately uh, tell where a variable came from. Um, uh, other coding standards were, uh, uh, let's see, uh, B, because Fortran allows you to have uh, on the fly definition and implicit typing of variables, we adopted the standard that there should be implicit none. And if you were using data modules that you could only use them by with the only construct, which uh, if you're trying to use a, a variable in a module that you haven't explicitly called out in where you're using it, it, it would be immediately caught. So this is an example of the kind of coding standards we needed to institute so that the code could be maintained by someone other than the person who wrote it as well. Um, <clears throat> One second. Yes. More about coding standards. Mm -hmm. So it seemed good to interrupt. Mm -hmm. Humans understand better patterns. After some time, we get used to understand the code by the patterns. Mm -hmm. Using the same code standard helps to understand better the code and find bugs. So it was more of a statement. This perhaps. is absolutely true. Yes. That is another advantage of coding standards. Um, so I think I was done with this slide, right? Yes, I was done with this slide. Um, so also many of these practices, as I said earlier, will be covered in much greater detail later in the series. So I'm not going to elaborate upon them a whole lot more. Um, um, a useful resource for collect, collect um, for uh, if you're looking for best practices is this link here, which is the how to's collected by the ideas productivity um, project. So there are two kinds of projects in this. One is the what is docs, which are the characterizations of important topics in computational science and engineering, and the how to docs, which are the brief sketches of best practices, um, basically that are easy to glance through and for people to quickly get information about them. Again, these are work in progress. Even the ones that have been published in some sense are work in progress in the sense that they're not written in stone. We are actively seeking feedback from the community, not just in terms of modification of these documents, but if people tell us that some specific documents will be very helpful, um, please get in touch with us at this project and we, they, they will be incorporated. Um, other resources are um, all of these various links. Some of them are papers, some of them are websites, and some of them are experience reports. Um, I've just compiled them so that people can, this is a further reading. And I think this is the end of, no, okay, there's still some more. The can, can I yeah. have one, one, one comment, or one, one statement question that came up um, was just an addition to that list, was a statement that I've been very impressed by the software engineering process employed by the Trilinos project. And, and Trilinos, Sandia.gov, if people don't know that, it's T-R-I-L-L-I-N-O-S, we will include that elsewhere. but. Um, uh, so uh, the person who's going to talk about the testing and documentation is actually a representative of, uh, of is a member of the Trulinos project. So I, you will get more examples from Trulinos in that talk, I'm sure. Um, see, we have collected people from various different projects. So ev every one of these uh, presentations will be somewhat tilted in terms of its examples towards the project from which a, a particular person came. It's only natural because that's when that's the one you know the best. Uh, so when you are looking at software engineering practices and you're trying to adopt them for yourself, for yourself, here is a general set of guidelines or best best practices or whatever you, one might want to call them. There is no all or none. You don't have to either do the practice or not at all. Just use as much of it as is useful for you and ignore the rest. So. The focus in adopting a practice practice should be absolutely on improving improving productivity rather than any purity of process. And it, it I mean, one runs against people who emphasize the purity much more. Cannot accept that a practice can be you know that you're not following a practice as it is designed. There is no such thing. You should absolutely adopt it for yourself. Uh, but. At the same time, I would like to caution that there is people, the first knee-jerk reaction is to be dismissive of things that you that are getting introduced to you that are likely to place, require some mental energy from you. So there is a danger in being too dismissive too soon because it may be that if you examine that practice without a bias and with 
open mind that you might actually find that practice to be very, very useful. And I knew I had an example in mind. At the moment, I can't remember it. If I do, I will um, give it. Because it's completely lined up with that. Another question. Mm -hmm. In scientific research, we want to get some quick results to make sure that we're on the right track. Mm -hmm. If we spend an enormous amount of time up front on software processes, programming can be a distraction from science. And we may not know what we're what that we are on the wrong track until a lot of time has already been spent on programming. So shouldn't there be a compromise between the software process and testing in the beginning phase of co-development? So um I will address that in greater detail when I go into um, uh, details about Flash's experiences. Uh, and actually, I will differ answering this question up to that point, because this is exactly what I address when I'm talking about community code and Flash development. Okay. Um, there is a fine balance between getting a buy-in from the team and imposing a process on them. And this, again, we've had experience in Flash that many times people from hardcore engineering and science will come in and they see the amount of process we have in place and at first rebel and say, why are we being made to waste this time? But fortunately, that's, there is a team and there are others like them. So what they find is slowly they get converted when, when they see the benefit. And um, you just have to keep it in mind that when you're asking people to adopt practices which require resources from them, the first reaction is resistant to change and suspicion of new process. Um, but one of the things that cannot be emphasized, overemphasized in a software project which has interdisciplinary uh, inter um, participants is that it is absolutely critical to make sure that those interactions are productive rather than uh, destructive. So a partnership model that has been found to work is uh, when the scientific users understand the importance of the code as in as a, in and of itself a thing that requires intellectual investment, creativity from its practitioners, and it's a research institute inst instrument that needs its own research where the developers and computer scientists have get the same kind of respect as the science domain as the domain scientists do <coughs> and comparable resources and autonomy at least uh, com resources comparable to uh, what is needed by the developers are given to them and their contributions are recognized and there is a careful balance between long term and short term objectives. In all of this, it is extremely helpful to have people that either have multidisciplinary training or are willing to learn about the other discipline because they become the ambassadors for interdisciplinary um, communication between teams. So, and that completes this section. Any other questions that are pending? before I go on to community development? No, okay. no new questions. Okay. So the last section of my talk is on community development. Um, why community codes? <laughs> community codes are useful because scientists, if there is a community code available, scientists can focus on developing their algorithmic needs instead of getting bogged down by the infrastructural development. And um, this goes back to one of the earliest questions that had come about why a lone scientist can't do make use of ALCF. Lone sci scientists absolutely make use of ILSA, the um, leadership class facilities. Um, there was an example at the Flash Center uh, who had taken the Flash code, at, which was designed for uh, type 1A supernovae, added a whole bunch of physics that was necessary for him to do his research, and gone on to run simulations and get good results. But the point is that he still relied upon Flash and all of the uh, capabilities that were already built into Flash, if he had to do the same thing from scratch, there is no way that he would have been able to successfully do his research. So in these communities where there are community codes, what happens is graduate students do not start developing codes from scratch, which means that they can get, become uh, invested in their research very early on in the cycle. They just look at available public codes and figure out which ones meet their needs the most. They look at the effort of customization, and based on all of these uh, criteria, they select a public code and build upon it as they need. Now, there is a word of caution about it because many people also think, especially for graduate students, that 
Um, if you don't understand the tool you're using, you can use it wrongly and arrive at wrong conclusions. And that is a very valid concern. So it is important that they still need to understand the components that, that are developed by others that, they, that they're using. They should know their limitations and the range of validity. And uh, But in particular, they don't have to worry about details like infrastructure, solvers, IO that are too well understood to have any research component, but are time consuming to implement right. So they get this advantage. Students are not the only ones that get advantage from this. The researchers can build upon work of others and get further faster instead of reinventing the wheel. There is much more code component reuse and there is no need to become an expert in every numerical technique. Uh, because someone else has implemented and because the code has been ex uh, exercised by many different people in many different ways, um, it, it does produce much more reliable results. Um, because anybody who has had any experience with um, non-trivial size code would know that it takes several years to iron out bugs and deficiencies. Um, and because different users use the code in different ways, um, it gets stressed in different ways. And so code just becomes better and more robust as time goes on. Uh, also, open science results, open source science results in more reproducible results. And that is generally good for the credibility of uh, science through computation. So I'm taking a closer look at the astrophysics community for two reasons. One is that it is one of the communities that was an earliest adopter of the community code model. And second of all, I have been particularly close to this community myself. Um, so this is a natural community for me to take, uh, take as, an, as an example. So this community had an early culture of releasing research software, and they started doing it as early as the 80s, where the NBODY codes for gravitational interactions first became public. And then Zeus 2D added hydrodynamics, which then later became also Zeus 3D. And um, smooth particle hydrodynamics codes like Hydra and Gadgets are other codes that have since come into being. Over time, these public codes became more and more sophisticated. For example, AMR appeared in Flash in the early 2000s. And then later, shock capturing MHD, radiation hydro, et cetera, also started to appear. Um, and here is the reason why astrophysics community was uh, quicker to adopt community code model. It's because uh, if you look at the figures that I'm showing, every one of them has many modules of physics. Some modules of physics are common among all of these codes, but many more are different. So what, ha what astrophysics needs is many different components in the code. They need, need mesh methods for gas dynamics, gravitational potential, radiation. They need particle methods for tracing or massive particles for n-body interactions. They need uh, zero dimension or point-wise calculation uh, for all kinds of equations of state and source terms. They also, because they have multiple scales, they also need adaptive mesh refinement for data and computation compression. And so development of such complex codes is beyond the resources of individuals or even small groups and community codes are the only solution. What about other communities? If you examine communities that have um, a community code model, what is almost always true in them is um, they need multi-physics and, and or multi-scale. They all start have have had a visionary that saw the benefit of software reuse and release the code and cause this movement to start. Uh, and in all of these communities, they, the benefits they reap is that the sophistication in modeling advances much more rapidly than the communities that keep their codes close. Um, they seem to do it for perceived competitive advantage. So what ends up happening in those communities is that there is repeated reinvention of wheels and the advantage, advancement of understanding is slower because there is repeated reinvention of fields. So let's examine what, take, what does it take to build a community code. Community code, um, just popularizing a code doesn't build a community because they'll just be users. And neither does customizability because different users want different capabilities. So what is important is enabling contributions from users and providing support for them including policy provisions that can balance IP that, uh, with open source needs and relaxed distribution policies, because the bottom line is 
that the more inclusivity is there is in a code, there is a greater success in building community. An investment in robust and extensible infrastructure and a strong culture of user support is absolutely necessary. And now I go on to three examples, Flash, Enzo, and YT. They have three different development models and community building models. So Flash was, uh, Flash was developed under sustained funding from the ASC Alliance program um, funded by the NNSA, DOE. Uh, one of the mandated outcomes from that was a publicly released code. The same code was to be used for many different applications. Um, so the uh, applications for reactive flows. And here is the answer to the question that came up earlier on, answer or at, at least discussion about it. So right from the beginning, there were two divergent camps. One camp wanted to produce a well-architected modular code, and the second camp, camp wanted to start a user code that could be used for science right away. Because both goals were hard to meet in the near term, two parallel develop, development paths started. But there weren't enough resources to sustain both. And initially, camp two won out. And I'm not saying that that was the wrong thing, but it eventually took three iterations of code refactoring to get robust framework built. And the extent to which the third iteration has been successful in community building could never have been done with the first two versions of the code. So this is the one takeaway. Um, the second takeaway, is, so let me go back to that slide. Um, so what, 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 what worked here was that in the first iteration, it was a code that was just smashed together, and there were only a very few people that could work with that code effectively and get science done. So fortunately, the center had resources to start doing one re cleaning up of the code and turning it into a much better structured code, and that exercise was undertaken. In the process, the code developer, developers had, had internalized some of the science needs, and so they were more effective in building it. And uh, the third iteration is the time when both parties had come to understand the need of the other side much better. And there was much higher degree of collaboration in building the code. So the answer is no one way of doing development is a clear answer for any code. However, even for doing a quick scientific development, giving some thought to future is always a good idea, though one should always be prepared to refactor codes at least once um, in order to get, if resources permit, in order to get an effective code. So I don't have a clear answer, but this is the best I can do. Question? Um, a follow-up to that was that camp one and camp two goals are not mutually exclusive. Many of the principles are, of, are the lean agile process fold into both of these goals nicely. Um, yes, they do. If you have a good interdisciplinary interaction already going on in your team, you can do it. Um, in Flash 2, in Flash, it hadn't started out that way, though it ended that way, which is a good story. Uh, Flash's community, um, it started out by being a code for astrophysics, but, and this, this truly started happening um, early on is that some of the communities started using like cosmology and solar physics started using flash and added their own capabilities because right from the beginning there was certain amount of structure even on the smashed together code which allowed for extensibility but once um, the final version the currently existing version came into being uh, it really took off and it got adopted by many more communities that have much more diverse and demanding needs so at the moment Flash has uh, Flash collects a database of paper that are pa 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 papers that are reported by the users of code themselves. In that database, there are 1,100 publications. Now, I'm not saying that that's the exact number. Uh, it may be an um, overstated number, but it gives a rough idea of the kind of impact Flash's uh, development has had. Uh, very little modifications to, ba to basic, basic infrastructure was needed to accommodate those capabilities, and any new capability that is added proves to be useful to other communities. Also, for example, radiation was added for high energy density physics, but it's equally frequently used by people in astrophysics and cosmology. Uh, Flash most, most, mostly follows a cathedral model, so this is uh, from this book um, by Eric, um, I don't remember the last name at the moment, 
on two models of development cathedral where there is a strong gatekeeping and bazaar where everyone can contribute to anything and flash is operating with the uh, cathedral model where the center does the gatekeeping community building took several years it uh, started out by be getting better interactions between the center scientists and the developers the yeah. alumni of the center took the culture and code with them and uh, in addition to that many on-site tutorials um, and tutorials at scientific conferences helped the as code became more robust and mature more it also became more inclusive and started taking um, contributions from external contributors and customizability also helped the greatest impact though was in relative ease in getting started customizability and reliability enzo transition from closed to open source. So Enzo is a cosmology code. It started as a closed code from 1996 to 2003. Its pub first public release was in March 2004. Now it has moved cl very close to the bazaar model where uh, the developers are scattered among many institutions and they write their science proposals and in that they make provision for some development resources and combined together then they're able to keep it going. Uh, it's an entirely distributed development model with small number of developers per, developers per, in, per institution. We, they use code, code forks and pull requests to move features. Almost all discussion happens on archived public mailing lists and on Google Docs. It has its own challenges in that uh, because there is no leader, it's hard to make major code revisions. The developers are part-timers, so they're distractions and significant work is required to build consensus and keep community mm -hmm. together. In contrast to both of these is YT, which is a project that started out by being open right from the beginning and it sought to build a community of builders. And this was uh, spearheaded by Matt Turk. And if you get a chance to, he gives a really great talk about sociology of code development. Uh, I think it's available somewhere on the web also, so you should absolutely see it. It's a fabulous talk. But so YT is the third part of this community where it's the newest. So it is also true that the, the codes, the three of them reflect different time frames in um, the development. Flash was early 2000s, late 1990s, early 2000s. Uh, Enzo became public in 2003, and by the time it became went into a bazaar mode, m many much more of distributed uh, version control was available. And YT is a is a much newer project, and so it, right from the beginning, it, it adopted many more software processes that the other codes had not done. And that brings me back to the summary. That brings me to the summary of uh, community codes. They they are most open source with governance structure in place. They invest in trust building among teams. They are committed to transparent communications. They have strong commitment to user support. They, are, they either have an interdisciplinary team or a group of people that are comfortable with both science and code development. They give attention, pay attention to software engineering and documentation and understand the benefit of sharing as opposed to being secretive about their codes. They um, pay attention to contributing policies where they balance the contribution and distribution needs. They have maintainable code requirements. So what, what they ask for from users is uh, source code, build scripts, test documentation, agreement on user support, um, and add-ons like components not included with distribution, but work with the code. So in conclusion, there are many reasons why software engineering practices are good and should be encouraged. Because science and engineering community by simulation needs more scrutiny into its methods and software if it has to be become the gain the same kind of credibility that exper experiment and theoreticians do. Uh, there is no need to keep reinventing the wheels. So, and this is especially true of bookkeeping. So it's much better to reuse infrastructural components. The days of heroic programming are, well, I shouldn't say entirely past, but that is productive with very few and far between uh, projects. And these kinds, the software in, uh, engineering practices are indispensable for extreme scale computing. It is extremely important to recognize that science through computing is only as good as the software that produces it. And as last thought, I want to leave you with this example that comes straight, straight from Flash. In 2005, a BlueGene L platform was made available to us to run a large simulation at a very short notice. We needed particles, tracer particles capabilities, which did not exist at that level in the code at that time. So we did a very quick and dirty development. When the simulation started running, there were uh, 
very many in-flight correction of defects. And we caught quite a few, but we did not catch all of them. One of them was simplification of the data structure, where tags that identify individual particles were encoded in the form of single precision floating point numbers. We hadn't paid attention to the fact that there were enough particles and that when they got converted to integers, they did round off. So we get duplicated particle tags. Um, when we started to um, do scientific analysis, we had to develop tools that could differentiate between two tags that had identical particles. And it took things like tracing their history to determine which particle should get which tag. And for that entire project, it took the flash, even though Flash already had a software process in place and it was tested regularly, this was one instance when we could not follow the full process. So we got ready for the run in one month. The run itself took a week to week and a half with many on in-flight corrections. It was six months of building tools, looking at data, reanalyzing data, about six months of work before we could actually begin to trust our processed results. And with that, I end my webinar. And we have we have one other question, which is, mm -hmm. can you give an example of how IP right, the, the IP intellectual property rights of contributors can be maintained? I assume that's what they mean by IP. Okay. So again, I will give an example of how we did this in Flash. Uh, what we did in Flash was, when someone wanted to contribute a code, we asked them to give the code to us and uh, give all of the necessary testing. Um, the, so at least one test that could be included in the test. But even before the contribution, there was a pre-negotiated time when the contributed code would not, would not be included in public release. So, but at the end of that pre-negotiated time, the code would be included in the public release because otherwise Flash, Flash developers had no interest, no um, interest in actually helping maintain that code. So in this pre-negotiated time, the code was maintained by the Flash Center. It was left to the use by the contributor and anybody else that that contributor gave access to. At the end of that time, the code was publicly released. Sort of a very related, but I'll ask in case it, in, it inspires anything different, was what do you recommend as a balance between making code open source versus maintaining some sort of IP protect, protection on the code? I mean, this seems very consistent with what you're discussing about the, the window, but. Right. So uh, in my personal opinion, um, there is very limited time for which keeping a code private is productive. And as I said, it is because you don't want someone else to scoop it. But once you have uh, published the results obtained from that source once, at least in my opinion, it is not a good idea to keep it private. Because then it becomes a question of reproducibility, provenance, et cetera, et cetera. And all of that dictate that the, pub, that the code should be available for scrutiny to anyone who wants to look at it. Any other questions? Not queued up. We can give another another couple seconds to see if there's any more questions that come through. No. So while the, before the questions come through, I want to say that the response that this webinar series has generated so far has been overwhelming and we are so pleased. And please, if you think that you can give any feedback that will improve this further, which will be particularly helpful to you, please feel free to write to uh, me or to anybody else in this team. And secondly, uh, this is not the end of interaction. So if you have questions that you want to uh, ask later, please, please do feel free to write to me or the rest of the team. All right. Okay, so before I absolutely leave, here is the uh, next webinar, which is coming exactly two weeks from today. This is on development, configuration, building, and deployment of HPC software on May 18th, and this will be given by Barry Smith. Thank you all for your time and attention. Thank you very much, Anshu. And, and to repeat um, something that was mentioned at the beginning, I just want to make sure everyone knows that 
there that the slides and video and audio will be available. You'll be able to access them through the same page that you registered. Um, and you can you also might see that in the chat, the actual chat, not, not Q&A. Um, but we can also reach out and, and let you know when those are posted. And uh, and again, following up with what Anshu says um, and what is online, we, we really welcome feedback. We really, you know, we, we see this as a way to help the larger community. And so understanding, you know, feedback about how today worked, about questions you have about today, about future topics, please, please let us know. Thank you Thank very you. much.